um, and like we do at most health law and ethics um, seminars, I'd like to just start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which um, we all are zooming in from today. Uh, for me, that's the Jar Jar Wurrung people, um, and I would like to pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging. And we'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where the University of Melbourne is based, and that is the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nations, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So we've got two speakers for you today, um, both giving you a very interesting genomics themed talk. Um, I'd like to introduce the first speaker, that is uh, Dr. Lauren Natini. Um, Lauren is a research fellow in the biomedical, in biomedical ethics at the Melbourne Law School and at the Medical Ethics Research Group at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Lauren's research combines empirical and theoretical methods in bioethics to identify and analyze ethical issues encountered by clinicians in their practice. Um, she'll be giving a talk titled Offering and Returning Additional Findings in the Context of Exome Sequencing for Hearing Loss, Clinicians' Views and Experience. After Lauren speaks, um, we'll then hear from Dr. Daniel Beers. Dr. Veers is a social scientist with a genetic counselling background who explores ethical issues relating to genetic testing. She is currently a senior research officer at the Biomedical Ethics Research Group at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute and is a member of the Education, Ethics and Social Issues Committee of the Human Genetics Society of Australasia and also our three task teams of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. And her title will be called, her, the title of her talk is Parent, parents experience when being offered and receiving additional findings for their children with hearing loss. So we'll hear from Lauren first. Um, after Lauren speaks, we'll hear from Danya, and then we'll come together for probably about 20 minutes of questions at the end. So without further ado, I will hand over to Lauren. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be um, presenting the findings of a clinician interview study that I led, um, looking at clinicians' views and experiences with both offering and returning additional findings in the context of exome sequencing, um, which is a type of genetic sequencing for hearing loss in young infants. Um, this is a paper in progress. So I'd first like to thank my co-authors on that paper, Clara Gaff, Julian Savalescu and Danya Beers. I'd also like to thank both Lillian Downey and David Amor um, for their assistance with recruitment strategies and also for their input um, regarding uh, some of the key information that the um, overarching clinical study um, that related to this um, qualitative research project um, that was very helpful to get some contextual information about that um, clinical study. I'd also like to thank the clinicians who participated in the interviews and this work was um, supported by the Australian government through its Medical Research Future Fund, which is part of the Genomics Health Futures mission. So I'm going to begin by presenting um, a broad overview of the current debate um, and the ongoing debate regarding offering additional findings in the paediatric setting. I will then um, describe the Melbourne Genomics Congenital Deafness Project, and then I will present the key findings from the qualitative interview study that um, I led with clinicians involved in that project. And following this, Danya will be presenting on a um, complementary study that she conducted interviewing parents who were also involved in that overarching clinical project. Um, so additional findings continues to be a matter of debate in the pediatric setting. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with additional findings, um, these are findings which are unrelated to the original reason for testing that are actively sought. And these are sometimes referred to as secondary findings. So there's ongoing debate regarding whether and when additional findings should be offered in the paediatric context. On the one hand, um, receiving additional findings could be beneficial for the child's health. Um, for example, in cases where um, the condition is thought to be preventable or treatable, and these are referred to as actionable additional findings. But the benefit may be less obvious in the case of non-clinically actionable additional findings. So some of the concerns that have been raised um, regarding additional findings in paediatrics 
is that offering these may infringe on the child's right not to know about their genetic information. Um, knowing this information could potentially lead to um, psychological and social distress for both the child and their parents, um, particularly in the case of non-clinically actionable additional findings. And there's also been some concern that um, receiving additional findings could potentially lead to future discrimination, for example, by employers or insurance companies. So the Melbourne Genomics Congenital Deafness Project um, was a project that looked at offering additional findings in the pediatric context, and specifically in the um, context of offering genetic sequencing for hearing loss. This project um, spans two main project sites, the Royal Children's Hospital and Monash Children's Hospital. And it aims to investigate both the process and the outcome of providing exome sequencing to both diag to diagnose hearing loss in pediatric clinical care. In order to be eligible to take part in this project, um, infants must have been born in Victoria between January 2016 and December 2017. And at the time of recruitment to this project, most of these infants were aged between three and nine months, with some under the age of three months. Um, infants must have been diagnosed with permanent um, bilateral hearing loss in both ears, um, rated moderate, severe or profound severity via the routine Victorian infant hearing screening program, which is typically um, conducted in hospital in the first few days of the infant's life. So infants who had unilateral hearing loss in one year only, mild hearing loss or temporary hearing loss were excluded from taking part in this project. And if you'd like to find out more about this overarching clinical project, um, I've included the details of the paper um, down here at the bottom right, um, the key paper which describes the project protocol. And this paper was led by Lillian Downey and colleagues. So the Melbourne Genomics Congenital Deafness Project had a diagnostic component, which was looking for genes related to the infant's hearing loss. But it also had a component known as the Baby Beyond Hearing component or the BBH component. In this component, parents were offered additional findings from exome sequencing that were unrelated to the child's hearing loss. Um, these additional findings related to childhood onset conditions and um, sometimes the child's carrier status was also offered. And parents who took part in this project could choose how much genetic information they wish to receive about their child. So parents who um, participated had three different results choice options that they could select from. Um, in choice A, parents would receive genes known to cause deafness. Um, so parents who chose choice A would not receive any additional findings. In choice B, parents would receive choice A, as well as information about childhood onset, clinically actionable conditions. So conditions which had um, a prevention or treatment available. And finally, in choice C, um, parents would receive choice B, as well as childhood onset conditions that may not be clinically actionable. And these statistics here show the proportion of parents in this um, project who chose each of these choice options. Um, as you can see, it was a fairly even spread, um, but slightly more parents chose choice C. Um, so the aims of my study um, interviewing the clinicians involved in this project were to explore their views and experiences um, regarding parents' decision-making about additional findings, um, when to offer additional findings to parents, any ethical challenges that clinicians had encountered regarding um, the additional findings component of the Melbourne Genomics Congenital Deafness Project, and also clinicians' experiences with returning additional findings results to parents. Um, eligible clinicians were um, identified by the clinical project lead, and then I received a list and I emailed these um, eligible clinicians an invitation to take part in this project. Um, in total, I conducted um, individual semi-structured interviews with 12 clinicians who were involved in this clinical project. Interviews ranged in duration from 25 to 59 minutes with an average interview time of 41 minutes. And then um, each interview was audio recorded and transcribed. Each interview transcript was analyzed using inductive content analysis and um, Dunya helped to verify the coding scheme that I developed. 
Um, this table presents a broad overview of the clinicians who took part in the interview study. Um, as you can see, there was a combination of um, different types of clinicians, um, including genetic counsellors, clinical geneticists, and um, one paediatrician. Clinicians also ranged in terms of how many years they had been practicing in their current profession. And um, in addition, um, we managed to recruit clinicians from both of the two main project sites, although the vast majority um, did come from one of the um, project sites. So according to the clinicians interviewed, parents had two main reasons for declining additional findings or choosing results choice A. And the first reason was that these parents felt that forewarning about later onset conditions unrelated to their child's deafness would not be helpful or could even be harmful. So this particular clinician stated that one parent was like, look, I don't want to open a can of worms. I just want to focus on the issue she's presenting with now. They just felt like it's not information they need to know, that they may not be able to cope well with that information because it may impact on how they view their child and their parenting. Other parents felt quite overwhelmed. They would just had a new baby. Um, they'd had a recent hearing loss diagnosis. Um, in many cases, um, clinicians described these parents as being in complete shock. They had had no um, family history of hearing loss. So they're still coming to terms with that initial diagnosis. And parents, um, according to clinicians, also felt quite overwhelmed with all of the different um, clinical appointments associated with hearing loss. So these parents felt that they didn't um, have the mental space to be able to think about additional findings at this point in time. So clinician five stated that you would define the two baby beyond hearing lists and parents would just say, nah, we've got enough on our plate. Let's just deal with this. On the other hand, um, parents also had um, several reasons for accepting additional findings or choosing results choice option B or C. Um, according to clinicians, some parents felt obliged to accept additional findings, even if parents did not want to receive them. And clinicians describe this um, using a term that's actually been um, coined in the literature known as the inflicted or. So clinician 11 stated that one family felt that once they had been offered the option of additional testing, choice B or C, that they couldn't in good conscience turn down that offer. They didn't think that it was in their child's best interests, but they didn't feel like they had a choice to say no. They felt this sense of inflicted or. Some parents chose additional findings because they wanted to feel more prepared for other later onset conditions that may emerge. So this clinician stated that a lot of the times the deafness diagnosis was unexpected. So it would be, we've had this unexpected health thing happen. Anything could happen now. We've had something rare happen to us. So we wanna do everything we can to reduce the risk of our child becoming unwell in the future. And other reasons for choosing additional findings according to clinicians included curiosity, wanting to rule out genetic conditions in the family history, wanting to achieve peace of mind, and also some parents believing that if they received more information, they would have a greater chance of finding out the cause of their child's hearing loss. Um, so reasons that parents chose option B over C, according to clinicians, mainly related to the fact that B related to these actionable additional findings that had um, an available prevention or treatment, but C did not. So these parents deemed option C as being too stressful or anxiety provoking. So this clinician said that often families who said, I'd be the watch and wait parent if I was stuck with this result and looking and looking and anxious were the families that did not opt into the list C. Um, on the other hand, reasons for choosing C over B according to clinicians included that some parents saw this information as being useful for life planning purposes even if it was not clinically actionable. So clinician five stated that some people would say, well, I want to be able to plan. If it does turn out that my child's going to have a short life, then we'll live our life differently with them. So it would be good to know. Some parents wish to avoid a future diagnostic odyssey. This clinician stated, these parents would rather know than not know especially given that these are all paediatric conditions, which at some point are likely to present or manifest in some way or another. It's better to know than not to know, 
and then have the effect of the diagnostic odyssey or have these symptoms sort of pop up down the track. Other reasons for choosing C according to clinicians were that C was seen by some parents as doing everything for their child. Some parents felt that they may as well get as much information as possible since it was on offer. And some parents believed that by choosing option C, they were helping the research. Um, clinicians also described how parents found the actual experience of making the decision about how much genetic information to receive. Some parents had a positive experience. They were grateful to have options. They found it quite easy to decide and they found making the decision interesting and enjoyable. So according to this clinician, some couples really enjoyed the process and they found this whole idea of having these sorts of discussions very interesting and stimulating. And it got them thinking about things and they really engaged in the process. But other parents had quite negative experiences with making these decisions. They found these decisions traumatic or distressing, paralyzing, overwhelming, challenging, stressful, for some parents, the decision could take weeks or months, and some parents expressed to clinicians anger at being offered this choice. For example, this clinician stated one particular family really stood out. They were very distressed at being offered the choice, and they were sort of angry with us for giving them that choice. The mother was very teary. She didn't feel like she wanted to have to make that decision, and it was very stressful for her. In terms of ethical challenges that clinicians encountered regarding additional findings, um, there are a few that um, uh, most of the clinicians raised. The first was whether or not parents could make a truly voluntary choice about additional findings, given this concept of inflicted or that clinicians spoke about earlier. This clinician stated, the fact that you've even offered it, you've already got this inflicted or on the table. You can't take it away once you've offered it, so are we doing the right thing by even offering it? Some clinicians highlighted the possibility that offering choice may promote parental autonomy, but it could also cause harm. For example, clinician nine stated that balancing this idea of non-maleficence with patient autonomy, wanting to give parents these sorts of options, but what happens if giving them these options actually harms them in a way? Um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, the term inflicted ought was um, first coined in the literature and specifically by Anderson and colleagues um, in a 2017 study that they conducted in Toronto, Canada. They observed this um, concept emerging in the context of 23 parents of children who underwent diagnostic exome sequencing for other symptoms, for example, developmental delay. In their study, um, parents were also offered clinically actionable adult onset additional findings for their children, um, but childhood onset additional findings were automatically returned to these parents. Um, so that's one key area of difference between their study and the Melbourne Genomics Congenital Deafness Project um, with the Melbourne-based study offering parents that choice whether or not they wish to receive the childhood onset additional findings. Whereas in the Toronto study, that was an automatic process. Um, Anderson and colleagues found through their interviews with parents that many parents chose these additional findings out of a sense of obligation, even if they believed that this information was not in their child's best interests. For example, if they had concerns about psychological distress or insurance discrimination. And Anderson and colleagues noted that while options provide choice, enhance freedom and empower individuals to make decisions for themselves or for their children, optionality increases responsibility, and this can be perceived as a heavy burden. Um, in our clinician interview study, clinicians had um, basically a broad consensus uh, emerging regarding when to offer additional findings to parents. For many clinicians, they believed that parents should be given the option to separate out the diagnostic and additional findings components of exome sequencing. These clinicians felt that additional findings should be offered later, either at or after the diagnostic results appointment where parents receive the genetic information about hearing loss. Reasons um, provided by clinicians for this view included that doing this was seen as being closer to usual practice in genetics, that it could lead to less confusion between the diagnostic test and additional findings, that this would be less likely to overwhelm parents, and that this would give parents more time to think about additional findings and adjust to their child's hearing loss. 
Um, however, clinicians also highlighted some practical considerations in that offering additional findings later could require multiple appointments and therefore a greater allocation of resources. For example, clinician one stated that offering this information separately certainly minimizes the risk of confusion. The parents have to make another trip to the clinic, but I guess that's a relatively small price to pay. And clinician four also stated that it's probably better to separate it. Often the families that I see when we first arrange testing are quite overwhelmed by having a child with a serious disability. So I'm not sure how good their consideration of the finer points of additional findings would really be. In terms of um, return of additional findings results, only one clinician uh, interviewed had returned positive additional findings results at the time of the interview. This clinician noted that this was likely due to the small gene list. They stated that we would counsel parents that the conditions were all rare and it's a small gene list. So the chances of finding something were unlikely. Clinicians reported that parents were um, quite relieved when no additional findings were identified. Um, for example, clinician six stated that usually when you would call parents with that non-diagnostic result for B and C, there was that huge amount of relief and parents were quite happy to hear that nothing had come up on those lists. So I feel that there is some level of anxiety based on the relief that you can hear when you give those results back. Clinicians also highlighted the importance of counseling parents regarding the limitations of current testing. And in particular, noting to parents that just because they have a negative additional findings result, this may not necessarily be definitive. So this clinician stated that trying to find out how to pitch the right level of reassurance at the testing has been a bit difficult. Saying to families, it is reassuring, but if you do notice any symptoms in your child, take them to the doctor as you usually would. So yeah, I think parents are relieved, but also know that you're not going to get a clean bill of health from genetics. We're here to provide uncertainty and maybe a little bit of reassurance. So in terms of ideas for future research, um, there are two different ways to um, go with this. Um, the first key area is to do some further bioethics research. Um, in particular, we think that it will be important to explore this concept of the inflicted ought further, and in particular, how this um, inflicted ought may or may not compromise voluntary decision making by parents regarding additional findings. It would also be worthwhile to conduct um, further qualitative research. Local context may influence views, so it will be important to conduct qualitative research with clinicians and parents who are involved with similar projects in other countries. And also another key limitation of the data that I've just presented is that this is clinicians' accounts of parents' decision-making. So there's an obvious need to um, interview parents directly to get their first-hand accounts and um, their first-hand experiences of how they found the process of taking part in this project. And fortunately, Danya has done this work. So I'll throw over to Danya now to talk about the parent study. Thanks, Lauren. Great segue. So yeah, as um, Lauren said, I conveniently conducted interviews with parents who were um, being offered and received additional findings for their children with hearing loss from the Melbourne Genomics and General Deafness Study. I'm going to present that to you today. So thanks to Lauren, I didn't have to go through a lot of background information, but I did just want to highlight that that particular study um, that Lillian Downey led was with 106 children who participated um, and they found a diagnostic yield of about 56%, which was quite impressive. Um, and with the Baby Beyond Hearing study, just a reminder that um, they, they had the choice between choices A, B and C, um, which were uh, A was the hearing loss genes alone, B was with um, the addition of uh, childhood onset treatable conditions, and C was with uh, childhood onset non-treatable conditions. Um, and just to flag that uh, out of that study, there were four infants who had uh, been found to have reportable variants from um, the additional findings, and they were all from that choice B category. Um, they found in that study that there were a couple of predictors of choice. Um, and so um, there was a five-fold increase of additional findings, of um, likelihood of choosing additional findings when uh, they had more than two children. And they were less likely to choose additional findings if they had children less than three months of age. And that's important for me to say because it really influenced the way I tried to sample across this population. 
So the aim of my study was to explore the views of parents whose children had participated in the Baby Beyond Hearing study. And I was particularly interested in how they felt about being asked to choose which results they wanted to receive and also their experiences with receiving those results. So as I mentioned, I tried to sample across a range of different characteristics within this population. So I obviously wanted to select um, parents who had made choice A, choice B and choice C, so we could see why they made particular choices. I also wanted to try and make sure that I got pay, um, parents whose children had and had not received a genetic diagnosis as the cause for their hearing loss. Um, I tried to select parents whose children were either first or second or later, so that we had a bit of a spread across whether they were the first child with um, child, first child in the family, which we know is quite a daunting experience alone, let alone having a child with hearing loss. Um, and also uh, the age of testing. So um, we de I definitely sampled across anywhere between less than three months of age, three to six months, six to nine months and greater than nine months. Um, and although the sites were split between RCH and Monash Medical Center, um, I also tried to recruit a couple of people that had been recruited regionally as well at regional clinics. So recruitment was all via telephone. I conducted semi-structured interviews either via telephone or Zoom at the patient at the parent's request. And I'm currently still analyzing the data using inductive content analysis. So this is sort of a sneak peek at some of the results that you're getting today. So I ended up interviewing 20 parents of 19 children. So there were um, two parents in one interview. Um, and nine of those, um, so 17 of the parents were female. Um, which is pretty standard in these studies, although I was grateful to get a few dads involved. Um, and then uh, uh, roughly half of the children were female. Um, and one of those parents um, had a mild to moderate hearing loss as well. So I managed to get a uh, spread, as you can see in this table, where roughly half had received a diagnosis um, and half had not. Um, two had received additional findings. So that was two out of the four that had received additional findings for the study um, that I got to interview. And then you can see there was a split across A, B and C, which roughly correlated with the percentages of um, parents who had selected each option for the study. Um, age of recruitment, there you can see, there weren't that many children in the study that were less than three months, um, but I managed to recruit a couple of the, the parents um, and a split across the others. And you can see there that I did get sort of roughly about half who were first, the first child in the family who was born with the hearing loss. Um, and then there, there were way more um, participants who were recruited at RCH, but I did manage to recruit three of the um, parents who had been recruited at regional clinics as well. So I'm gonna talk to you about four different aspects of the results today. The first is their reasons for choosing um, A, B or C their feelings about being able to choose which types of results they could have from the study, um, their experience of receiving results, and then also their thoughts on when to offer additional findings. So I tried to correlate this data I'm presenting with what Lauren presented to you just before, so we can contrast the findings a little bit. Um, so re reasons for choosing number A, which is the hearing loss genes alone. Um, a lot of them who chose A felt quite overwhelmed by the diagnosis and appointments. And they really flagged that there was just a, a lot going on at that particular point in time. Um, and then some parents said that they also weren't keen to know about other conditions. And one parent highlighted that they were worried that this might lead to unnecessary investigations. So as this parent said, another sort of thing they talk about at the time is that cascade of um, interventions, they talk about that in maternal health interventions all the time, about how like once there's a problem, so we have to do an, addition, an annual scan for this and every six months we're gonna do a blood test for that sort of thing where you're causing more issues than you're helping. In terms of the reasons that parents selected um, or proposed for having chosen number uh, choice B, they said they were quite keen to receive health information, but really only provided that you can do something about it. And they were very clear that they didn't want to know things that they couldn't do anything about. Um, and one parent flagged that she was uh, pleased to receive the information because if it had, if she had actually received a diagnosis from this, um, it might've been able to save time to diagnosis. So as this parent said, my thinking was that if she was to get sick and start having some kind of symptoms, 
um, the process for finding out what potentially what was causing that sickness or those symptoms could be quite a long process of like elimination, for example, trying to work out what's wrong with her. And if, but if we had this genetic testing and we knew that she had these genetic predispositions, then we could go onto it, get on, we could be onto it straight away. In terms of reasons for choosing um, choice C, basically these parents were those, the more information, the better kind of people. Um, and that feeling that if they were forewarned, being forewarned is for, for forewarned is forearmed, sorry, um, even if they can't do something about it. So as this parent said, well, my husband is the type of person who likes to know things, even if there's no treatment for things. I guess it reduces his anxiety knowing things. More information is better for him. I think more information is better too. You know, then we can do something, some research or support them the best way we can if they did have the certain condition. In terms of their feelings about being offered additional findings, um, similar to what Lauren found with the clinician's perspectives, several of the parents found the choice quite easy to make. They didn't labor over the decision, but others did find it quite difficult. And this was particularly the case um, because of that busyness around the time of the diagnosis that I highlighted earlier. So um, as this parent said, I think we're very grateful to have the choice, sorry. But at the time it was pretty um, overwhelmed, of overwhelming with everything going on, just knowing that my son was profoundly deaf and we didn't know what that looked like. I don't know if it's the health system or particularly with the hearing or so what, but I sort of felt pretty lost. Uh, others found that it was difficult, not just because of the busyness, but because of the weight of the decision that they were making. And they were very concerned about trying to take into account the, the child's future feelings about having um, had this testing done. So as this parent said, it's a big decision. Like I felt the weight of that decision. What we were worried about is if we didn't get a full genetic test and then when she turns 18 and she knows that we did it, you know, that's her personal, that's her body and whether or not we should be making that decision for her, especially if having the test was then going to affect her somehow in the future. Others um, had concerns about insurance. Um, and this was despite the fact that they did recognize that they had been discussed, this had been discussed in the genetic counseling, but there was quite a lot of uncertainty about what kinds of insurance and, uh, might be impacted and whether that would be an issue for that child in the future. So as this parent said, I think to just say, okay, it's your choice, but then it's your risk as well. It's kind of really unfair because, okay, so now we have to decide either to know about our son, you know, laughs or to avoid problems with the insurance in the future. So it's really big on the parents. It would be easier if we would have like a legal issue associate to talk to. Um, despite this, most said that they were very grateful to have been offered the opportunity to choose um, the fact that they had this opportunity to choose about whether the child um, had the additional findings or not. And some found it very empowering. And that was both parents who did and who chose not to, who, who chose to and who did not want to receive the additional findings as well. So this parent said, for us, that's quite empowering to know that we didn't just, we don't just have to go with um, what's put in front of you. To be part of a study like this, where you get the decision and you're in control of what you're doing is massive. There were two parents who flagged that they would have preferred not to have been asked and not to have made the choice. Um, for one, they said they just wanted to receive as much information as possible and not to even bother asking them about it. So they were a parent that chose choice C. Um, and the other said that they would have preferred just to have the doctor recommend what the testing should be, what was required. Um, and they felt that the hearing loss test should just be automatic because it's a diagnostic test. So that should also not be a question. Um, no parent that I spoke to, and I, I, Lauren had already done her interviews at this point, so it was something I was quite alert to, but no parent said that they felt forced to choose just to receive additional findings just because it was offered. So I didn't see any of this inflicted ought coming out in my interviews. In terms of their experience of receiving results um, and their reactions to the additional findings results, the parents who, obviously the majority of parents who received um, additional findings results received negative results so that their child didn't have an additional finding. Um, and there was a lot of relief at this. So as this parent said, 
the main concern that we had was finding out if there was anything else that was associated with it or, you know, if there was another condition that we had to be wary of or to be prepared for. And knowing that there were no other impending issues, this was a big relief. Of the two that had an additional finding identified, the first was, a, um, that, was that the, the daughter had been identified as, as having von Willebrand's disease, which is a clotting disorder. So this parent said it was really good to know because she felt more prepared in case her child had to have any surgeries or anything down the track. So as this parent said, it's really important because she never may never bleed excessively like in surgery and stuff, but if they know um, going in, then they know it's a risk factor and they know to be prepared. The other parent actually didn't remember receiving their additional finding. Um, so I didn't tell them during the interview that they had received an additional finding, obviously, but I was trying to unpick what they remembered about the results they'd received. Um, so as this parent said, I don't even remember what other results were disclosed. They didn't seem very critical and yeah, so we just chose to ignore them. One thing to flag was that this parent had received a diagnosis for the cause of their hearing loss in their child, whereas the other parent hadn't. Um, and finally, I just want to talk about when to offer additional findings in, in um, relation to what the parents thought and how things would go for them. Um, so some of the parents and quite a few of them felt that it would have been good, to, it was good just to offer hearing loss and additional findings at the same time. They were concerned that if you split up the two tests, then there might be some delays in the return of additional findings, which they already felt took quite a long time. Um, and similar to what Lauren found with the clinicians, um, they were concerned about having to have additional appointments where they'd have to come into hospital for that. Um, however, others thought it would be better to offer the additional findings as a separate uh, decision after the hearing loss results. And this was because they felt like they had too much to think about at the time with all of the appointments. Um, and once one flag that if it had been offered at a separate time point, she may have actually elected to receive additional findings where, as she didn't at the time of the test. Um, and it seemed like this was partially dependent on their experiences of their hearing loss pathway um, and also their experience of parenting. And this is why I thought it was really important to interview parents um, who for both whom it was their first child and also those whom it wasn't their first child who had the hearing loss. So as this parent said, I think for us as second time parents, um, I don't know, you feel a little bit more in control. You know what you're doing, you know what to anticipate really. I think if it, I had been a first time parent, I would have been very different scenario, um, especially with a child that's being diagnosed with a disability so early on. Um, and one parent that I spoke to actually queried the timing of the testing in general, saying that um, was it really appropriate to be offering any genetic testing at that particular point in time when there was so much going on, particularly as for a lot of, in a lot of cases, it doesn't actually um, influence the treatment pathways or anything like that. So just to conclude, um, parents were generally very grateful to have been offered additional findings, even if they didn't end up taking it up at all. Um, some found the choice of additional findings difficult, um, and this seemed to be at least partially linked to their experience of the hearing loss diagnosis um, and all the things that were going along with that at the time with um, appointments and everything. Um, there was a lot of relief at receiving negative additional finding results. Um, but interestingly, the parents didn't say, they said, it's not like I was really thinking about it all the time. So it wasn't like in their minds bothering them, they weren't worried about it. But they did say when we got the result, it was nice just to have that ruled off um, as something we didn't have to be thinking about anymore. Um, and interesting of the parents who did receive additional findings, they seemed to place different weights on the findings with one finding it really, really helpful and the other one not even remembering it, um, which I said may have been to the, due to the fact that um, they, the one had and hadn't received a diagnosis. So I just wondered if we need to know a bit more about the impact of that. Um, and as I said, there were some split views on when to offer additional findings. So it sort of seemed that it would be appropriate to offer it at time one, where at the same time, but perhaps to allow parents for whom it was just too much to take in in one go, um, the option to defer it later on if they wished. Thank you. Great.
thanks very much, um, Daniel and Lauren, for two really interesting talks. Um, what I might get people to do is if they've got a question to use the raise hand function in Zoom, um, and I will call you out and ask you to unmute and that, that way you can ask your question. Um, I might just get us started though, and I might just ask both of you to maybe just comment about that last um, topic that Daniel was talking about, about the timing of the offer. So I did hear from Lauren's talk that a lot of the parents are feeling, you know, that the clinicians thought the parents were feeling overwhelmed and that was somewhat reflected in Dania's talk. So do you think it is better to wait to offer to parents to make these decisions? Or do you think there's some cost that if you are offered them to wait, people might slip through the system and that you might actually, you know, lead to sort of worse clinical sort of benefits for people in the long run? Lauren, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, I think offering them the option is what's the key um, factor here. So if there was some way to do that, perhaps in the um, consent process before parents actually embark on the exome sequencing, so they get to make that decision ahead of actually um, having the result there on the table. Um, so in that particular scenario I've got in mind, um, parents could be asked, when we do get the exome sequencing results for um, deafness, um, would you prefer to receive that before we ask you about additional findings? And then that way um, parents could uh, have be able to make that choice. Um, but I suppose the potential limitation of that is that that would kind of be a hypothetical decision. So it may be possible that parents may make a different decision in the moment when they actually know that the results are there. But I think giving parents the option is what's most important rather than um, assuming that all parents would kind of fall into one category or the other, just acknowledging that different parents will have different preferences relating to that. Great. Do you want to comment, Danya? Um, just to reiterate, I guess, that the being offered the choice was something that was really valuable. So I did sort of try to flesh out if parents had been, would have preferred not to have been offered the choice at all. Um, and even those who didn't want it thought that it was really great to have been offered it. I definitely think in terms of the timing, um, I think it would be nice to have the flexibility in any system that was um, offered in future going forward if there was to be any further testing for parents to be able to say, yeah, I want it now, let's just do it all in one go, or mm, can you ask me again? down the track um, when you, when I get the test results for the hearing loss. So I, I agree with Lauren that I think there's a place for that. All right, great. Um, well, we have a question from um, Lillian Downing who was involved in this original research. So it'd be very interesting to hear from her. So um, Lillian, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Thanks Lauren and Dania, that was really fascinating. Um, I just wanted to ask Lauren about your comment about inflicted or impacting on people making a voluntary decision, which I just thought was a really interesting concept, like that feeling like you should um, take up an offer sort of takes away some of your voluntariness, which I hadn't really thought of before. Yeah. Um, so I was just interested by that idea. Sure. Um, so I did get this sense from clinicians, kind of this underlying concern that if parents were experiencing this, perhaps that could be, um, I suppose, perceived of or thought of as a form of internal coercion. And, and in um, the ethics literature and particularly in informed consent, there's a whole bunch of debate of um, what conditions are needed to make a sufficiently autonomous and voluntary decision. And sometimes these um, internal factors or um, internal senses of obligation are sometimes highlighted in ethics as um, potentially in some situations, um, maybe compromising that ability to make a voluntary decision. Um, so I think that's definitely an area that's worth looking at in more detail, um, kind of with the knowledge that if a lot of parents do experience this, is that always necessarily um, a factor preventing parents from making that sufficiently autonomous decision? Um, I'm not sure that it is, but I think it's definitely an area that would be um, worthy of future theoretical bioethics research just to flesh out that concept in more detail in the context of that existing informed consent framework. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. Can I, I just know about add, all that ethics background, so that was very helpful, thanks. Can I just quickly add to that? One of the challenges, I guess, is that um, if you don't offer someone something 
they don't have the chance to to make a decision about whether they want it or not and so it's a tricky thing because I think that um you know you we try to make allow people to make autonomous choices um but if you don't people don't know what's on a, what's on offer until you tell them about it all right thanks both um we have a question from um Valerie Song Valerie do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question uh, not a question, but a reflection. But thanks, um, Dania and Lauren, such important work. But um, I guess in my clinical experience from just that cohort that went through Lian's testing, a lot of the families have subsequently regretted not having taken up the um, exome offer. So, um, you know, I guess the timing really does, um, you know, and, and repeatedly offering, I guess, or having it available in the future would um, probably be quite important. Can I just ask, Val, do you mean um, they, the whole test, as in they, they chose not to have the sequencing for the hearing loss as well? Yeah, that's right, yeah. So some of the families who decided not to go ahead with A, B or C, subsequently their kids might have some kind of other comorbidities and then they want to find out, but then it was too late already to, um, to take up the test. That's interesting. So they're more interested in the test results for the additional findings than they are for the hearing loss in those situations then. I'm um, coming from the concentrating on the hearing, but um, some of them have also kind of talked about, I guess, the other options that were offered. Mm. Yeah, that was that something was that kind of came out um, in the clinician interviews as well, that um, thinking of this as being quite a time limited offer and parents having a very limited window to um, either opt in or opt out of the study and um, quite a few clinicians actually mentioned that they um, kind of preferred the option to be on the table for longer than it was to kind of um, allow for that possibility that parents may later change their mind rather than saying you need to make a decision in this very narrow time window and just acknowledging that parents May take a bit longer to decide whether or not they want to take part. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, I see we've got a question from um, Fiona Lynch. Uh, Fiona, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, Daniel, I've got a bit of a, a question from uh, a slightly different angle. I was interested in that parent who didn't remember the additional finding. How did you manage that? Having that information yourself, you know that they've received an additional finding, but they don't realise. Do you have, or do you, did you feel like you had any obligation to go back to the their treating clinician, for example, and, and flag that with them? Um, yeah, so it's something I haven't, I've given a bit of thought to, but haven't um, actioned yet. So interestingly, I mean, I was going to talk to Lily and Downey about it because um, it's something that I think as the one of the people who was on that study and led that previous study would, would be um, the person to speak to. I guess... Um, my feeling is that they have been told the information. Um, it's definitely something they were told in the appointment and we can double check that, I guess, by looking at their notes. Um, and I sort of feel like it may depend on what it is. If it's something that's in really important, then maybe there could be some obligation just to make sure that they understood it. But at the same time, it's not really our role to tell people what they think should be important about their test results. So it's a tricky one. Mm. Yeah, I can add to that. Um, one of the funny nuances that happened with the analysis was we weren't intending to give back any carrier results, but we ended up giving back a couple. So I guess we would have really, we really downplayed them in the appointments as not significant for the child's health. So that's one factor. But there was also a family that had additional findings that opted not to receive them. So I don't know if it was that family. No. Uh, we decided not to approach them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no so I don't know I don't know what that result was um that this person had I don't think it was just a carrier result though I think it was an actual additional finding so yeah interesting we can chat offline Lil. <laughs> sounds good okay I, I see another question here from Akila um Akila I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name but do you want to um unmute yourself and um ask your question yeah, thank you. And yeah, it's a killer, so no problem. Um, my question was really specific, but I know that in the Baby Beyond Hearing study, um, parents were offered a decision aid. And I was wondering if 
this was brought up at all in any of the interviews about whether it helped them to make a decision in the study or whether it played a role in getting their informed consent to receive the results? Um, that's a great question, Akila. Um, so I have to flag, I should have said this, that, that these interviews with the parents were done a couple of years after they received the results. So it wasn't like they had just made the decision. So it was really just uh, reflecting back on their choices they'd made. So um, probably unsurprisingly, they didn't therefore remember that much about A, the information session that they'd had about where they found about, out about the genetic study. They definitely remembered a lot about which choice they made and, and why. Um, but they, I didn't really bother asking a lot about the decision aid because um, they didn't really recall often receiving it. Um, one thing that the, a couple of parents flagged was that they really found having both the in-person session and also the um, physical piece of the paper given to them quite helpful, but they didn't really talk about using the decision aid at all. And if I can add to that as well, um, the decision aid also came up in the clinician interviews, but a lot of the clinicians mentioned that although parents had been sent it, um, a lot of them did not look at it or complete it before the appointment. Um, so they ended up, um, some clinicians ended up bringing it out during the appointment as a tool to use, um, although it was intended for parents to look at it before the appointment. So it was kind of used in a slightly different way to what um, they had initially intended in some cases. But um, some clinicians also found the decision aid being quite helpful in supporting their role as a clinician, um, although others felt that it was more of a resource for parents and clinicians already had a kind of checklist in their mind of things that they would usually go through with parents. So for those clinicians, they didn't feel that the decision aid um, added anything further to their role in supporting parents. But um, yes, that was quite interesting. Great, thanks both. Um, I've just been, I've been just thinking about it as we've been doing about the inflicted ought then, so I don't mean to sort of drag us back there, but I just thought I might have a few comments, because I thought it was interesting, Lauren, that the clinician that you spoke to about it was sort of saying the people were inflicted about this decision, and therefore maybe we shouldn't have offered the question, offered the choice. And, and I was just thinking, does that seem right? And sometimes it seems right, so sometimes... I'll feel inflicted about a decision just in everyday life and I feel like someone should have offered me that. So an example is if I've said I'm going to have a couple free day and then my wife offers me a glass of wine in the evening, I'm very inflicted about the decision. I don't know what to do and I feel like, yeah, they shouldn't have offered me that choice. But in other cases, you know, someone might ask you if you want to buy something or just if you want to go out at night or if do something and it seems just wrong to be, say that you shouldn't have been offered that choice and that the infliction is not something that you should say that you should be denied a choice about. Do you have any thoughts about like I guess the um, impact of an inflicted ought and whether it means we should offer practice or not? Yeah I think it's definitely important to acknowledge it but I agree that that concept in itself is not a reason to avoid giving people the choice altogether. I think there are ways to um, support parents who may be dealing with that or um, even in so far as just naming it and acknowledging that feeling and giving parents targeted support if they need help kind of working through that feeling. Um, but I think for some of the clinicians, they did speak about kind of being caught off guard by this. Um, they kind of went into the project thinking that this is great. Parents are going to react very well to being offered this choice. And then to have some parents um, kind of express anger outwardly towards the clinician, I think that did catch a lot of the clinicians off guard. And I think perhaps some of the clinicians may have um, kind of internalized that and thought, well, wait, did I do something wrong here in my role as a clinician? So that may be behind that thought that, well, maybe I shouldn't have offered it. So maybe some clinicians are kind of looking at, was there anything I could have done differently in the situation? But um, my personal view is that even if this concept does exist, um, that in itself is not necessarily a reason to avoid giving people that option because there's lots of benefits to being offered different choices and um, that can definitely outweigh this inflicted ought. But I think naming it is definitely helpful and um, yeah, if parents need more support working through that, that would be helpful as well. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense to me as well. Um, all right, great guys, well, we're nearly at two o'clock. 
Um, I would like you to all join me in um, thanking Danya and Warren for um, two wonderful talks. Um, I, we will be back next month um, with the Health Law and Ethics Network. I actually don't remember off the top of my head what speakers we have next week, but look, check your emails and we will be advertising the next talk soon. And I hope you can all join us then. All right, thank you all and um, have a lovely afternoon. Thanks everyone. Thank you.